Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on wherever you are. And welcome to another webinar co-organized by ANT Neuroeducation. My name is Ishwar Gumri. I am product manager for research solution at ANT Neuro. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Susan Boyer. Dr. Boyer is a biomedical physicist, neuroimaging scientist in the Department of Neurology at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. She is also a scientific director of the Neuromagnetism Lab. She has been using neuroimaging techniques such as MEG, EEG, fMRI to understand how brain process. She also developed neuroimaging methods to determine the location of abnormal brain areas such as epilepsy prior to surgery. Uh, previously, she has investigated the cortical networks in several neuro neurological disorders. Dr. Boyer received an associate degree in business management, a bachelor's degree in psychology, and a PhD in biomedical physics. Currently, she's an associate professor at Oakland University as well as Van State University in, in the School of Medicine. The title of today's presentation is Advantage of Simultaneous EEG and MEG Recording from Patient with Epilepsy. Dr. Boyer, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and being here with us today. The screen and the stage is all yours. We are looking forward for your talk. Thank you, Ishwar. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me to give a talk on the complementary nature of MEG and EEG. I have actually been in this field 25 plus years. Um, we started out with an MEG system with seven channels and you can see I'm the test subject there. Um, and then in uh, 2005, I think it was, uh, I got my first portable EEG system and you can see me in the car with my cap on and Dr. Zana was running the EEG system and my colleague Dr. Shea is in the back seat running the distraction paradigm. This was a driving study with a cell phone conversation to see how your brain activity changed when you were on a cell phone uh, or when you were just driving down the road. Um, and then we went to the MEG system. And so now we have 148 channel whole head sensor. And normally we put the patient in with the electrodes on, whether it's the cap or the um, just the pasted and uh, marked and pasted electrodes put onto the head. I um, mean, so with our driving study, we did it on the road. And then with the CAP, we went straight into the MEG system and did the exact same study, but in the uh, controlled environment of the lab. I mean, if you're going to run with a CAP with the MEG system, you need to make sure that your MEG is a, uh, your CAP is a MEG compatible CAP. And so I do both research and clinic. And so I was just kind of interested in, in the group out here. If you could tell me what your background is, are you more clinical, more research, or more both? So just give me an idea of what kind of a audience that I'm talking to. So I'll give it a minute, and then I think Ishwar is going to put up the results for me. Yeah, you can uh, cast your poll. Let's give it a few seconds. Few more seconds. <laughs> yeah, let's let's close the poll. So we have a pretty good response. Uh, it's a 50 percent of the uh, audience have a research background. Um, so only 30, 13 percent of them have a clinical background, and 22 percent of them have both clinical as well as research background. And 16 percent of the audience is from other background. Great, thank you. So it's nice to see that there's lots of research and clinic. Um, uh, backgrounds there. So today's talk, we're going to talk about electroencephalography or EEG, which is where you're going to either measure and mark the locations on the brain and then scrub up the scalp and paste an electrode with some paste on it to get a good contact. Or you can use a cap that you'll put onto the head and then you'll fill the cups with gel so that you get a good connection between the scalp and the wire that's going to detect the electric potential at the brain. And so it's going to measure the electric potential just on the scalp and you're gonna get uh, different sorts of frequencies that you're gonna be able to see waveforms. And so when we look at the caps, oops. Oh, so um, another polling question, sorry. Do you have experience with EEG, both with acquisition and analysis, or only with acquisition, or only with analysis, or only theoretically or not at all? So I just, my polling questions are here at the very beginning of the talk. Um, and then when I get into the most of the talk, then there's gonna be no more polling questions. Yeah, 
more than half of the audience voted, but let's give it a few more seconds. Nice. I think we can close the poll. Yeah, so um, almost 54% uh, 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 participant have uh, experience with both acquisition as well as analysis. Um, that there are there are 17 percent audience only uh, have experience only with the analysis. 20 percent have experience which is theoretical, and nine percent of them don't have any experience. Oh, great! So it sounds like most of the people have some um, experience with EEG, which is great. And so normally with the 1020 system, we're putting on anywhere from 20 up to 256 electrodes. Um, and when you're marking and measuring. When you get over 45 or over 60, it really pays to have a cap because measuring and marking that many electrodes, um, pasting them onto the person's head takes a long time and your technologist will really appreciate if you have a cap for these higher dense arrays for EEG. And then the other part of the talk is talking about magnetoencephalography or MEG. And this is where we're measuring just the very weak magnetic fields that are just outside of your head. And most MEG systems are helmets and they have anywhere from 103 to 248 coil locations. Um, and so by physics, wherever there's a current flowing in your brain, especially in the neurons, you'll have a magnetic field. And if you point your thumb in the direction of the current flow, your fingers will wrap around and they'll be in the direction that the magnetic field is um, flowing. And that magnetic field is what we wanna detect with the MEG system. Um, sometimes it's called magnetic source imaging. Um, and that's just where we actually put the results onto the MRI. And like I said, most of the time with the MEG systems in the clinical environments across the country and around the world, most people do simultaneous EEG and MEG. So we get the best of both worlds. So how many people have experience with MEG? I'm assuming that this will be a much smaller percentage since how there is only about 40 MEG systems in the US and maybe about 300 worldwide. Almost half of the audience uh, voted already. Let's give it a few more seconds. I think we can close the poll. Yeah. So um, the answer uh, almost 20, uh, 26 percent participant have experience with MEG, but remaining 26% have experience to some extent, but there are almost 47% participants who do not have any experience with MEG. And that makes sense, as I said, it's, uh, you know, the MEGs are so limited on where you find them um, that it's hard to really get experience with them. I mean, so when you look at an MEG waveform and an EEG waveform, they look identical because they're both measuring uh, the, the one's measuring the electric potential and the other's measuring the magnetic field. And so they're waveforms. I um, mean, so the EEG is in microvolts and the MEG is in femtotesla. So both of them are extremely small values that we're detecting with these systems. I mean, when you're doing the MEG and the EEG simultaneously, if somebody moves their head, you see the head movement in both the MEG and the EEG. If somebody blinks their eyes, you see the eye blinks in the EEG and the MEG. And also a seizure, if somebody happens to have a seizure, you see that easily in both the MEG or the EEG system. So both of them can be used to look at epileptic activity. The one thing about EEG that is positive over MEG is that the MEG is very sensitive to metal in the body. So anytime a piece of metal moves, there'll be a magnetic field created. So patients that have VNS implants or pacemakers or DBS or extensive dental work will actually have this more noisy MEG system. And so it's really good when we have this type of a patient that we have the EEG because the EEG is not affected by that metal artifact like the MEG is. So you can see the, the MEG is really degraded with, the, with just the body movement from the heart beating and from them breathing. I mean, so normally we're evaluating epilepsy patients that are drug resistant. And the World Health Organization estimates that 50 million people have epilepsy, which is a seizure disorder of the brain. But the 70% of these people could be seizure free if they were diagnosed and treated. Um, there's a real risk of premature death. And in many parts of the world, the people with epilepsy are stigmatized or discriminated against. So many times they don't seek the treatment that they need. So when the patients are coming for the MEG with the EEG, usually they have had 
uh, EEG studies that either show that they're negative for spikes or that there's ambiguous finding and they're not sure where in the brain the epilepsy is really coming from. Um, the uh, MRI might be negative, meaning that there's no uh, lesions or tumors or uh, the cortical dysplasia or things that we can think of would be a reason for the epilepsy. And at this point, they're drug resistant. And so they're looking for surgical options. Um, whether a surgical option would be a, a resection, an ablation, uh, we could put in a responsive neurostimulator, which is electrodes that go in the brain, and then a little computer that sits in your scalp and will disrupt, disrupt your network and cause your seizures to hopefully be reduced. And so when you're coming to the MEG system, um, you want more mapping than you just got from the EEG systems you had. And so we, we do a more detailed um, mapping with the MEG and the EEG. Um, in 2003, Dr. Greg Barkley, who's the chair of neurology here at Henry Ford, and Christopher Baumgartner, who's the chair at the Sigmund Freud University in Vienna, uh, they wrote many talks on the pros and cons of MEG, and they came up with this nice paper that really provided that MEG and EEG provide unique neurophysiological data that's not obtainable by other neuroimaging techniques. They both have that millisecond temporal resolution, so you can follow the evolution of a spike or a seizure, and then with the EEG having so many um, samplings now with more electrodes, we actually have adequate space in both techniques to do that source localization. I mean, is one really better than the other? And, and back in the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of um, back and forth about one is better than the other, but now we realize that there isn't. There's pros and cons of both. And I won't go into all of these, but the main take home is that the EEG is really preferentially detecting any activity that's in the gyral sources. And MEG is really preferential for detecting any sources that are inside the sulci or the wrinkles in the brain. And so John Eprazal, who's a renowned expert in both MEG and EEG, has been giving this sort of a talk that I'm giving today for like the past 20 years. And he really shows, and then what I'm hoping that I'm going to show you with some of my case presentations here, is that given the different orientation of the neurons in the brain, the MEG and the EEG are sensitive to different ones. And so the tangential and the radial source components can be detected by one or the other. Um, and if there is actually a lag or a lead between an epileptic spike or the seizure onset, that this will show us that it's actually propagating in the brain, and we can tell where it's propagating from and going to, so we can characterize it more fully. So which technique do you think will see more spikes from epileptic patients, those in the EEG or those in the MEG, or do you think it'll be about the same? Almost half of the participant uh, voted already. Great. Uh, let's give it a few more seconds. Uh, I think we can close the poll now. Great. Uh, the results are uh, uh, interesting. Uh, which method sees more spike? 37% uh, audience think that it's EG. Uh, 31%, uh, so it's a quite a tie, also sees that it's, uh, it's MEG, and uh, the remaining things, the remaining 31% see it's the same. So, uh. and those are And those are great numbers. Um, and so in 2005, Dr. Iwasaki at Cleveland Clinic did a study on 40 patients that he had both MEG and EEG on, and he found that in 20% of the patients, he saw the spikes in both EEG and MEG. But 50% of the patients he only saw an MEG, and 30% he saw only an EEG. Um, and Dr. John Ebersol thought about those numbers and thought, well, that's maybe not quite what I see. So he looked at a bigger group of number. He looked at 300 patients, and he found that in that 300 patients, 56% had spikes in both MEG and EEG, 36 had them only in the EEG, and 8% only had them in the MEG. And so a lot of times this yield of how many spikes you see in different type depends on when patients are being sent to the MEG center. So a lot of times by the time they come to the MEG center, uh, they, you know, they've, they've had the EEG, they've had the MRI, they've had all the other workups. And so, you know, they're, they're looking at MEG to maybe provide some extra information that's not seen. One of the nice things that came out of uh, Dr. Ebersol's talk here is that you'll find that sometimes the EEG spike comes first and sometimes the MEG spike comes first. 
And he found in those 56 patients where you see them both at the same time, not all of them were simultaneous or in sync. Some of them, the A8% the MEG was leading and 5% the EEG was leading. And so let's just look at uh, where the MEG and the EEG are detecting the spikes from and maybe we can determine why one might see one before the other and why they would be a little bit different on their components. So this is the brain and we have lots of wrinkles which are the sulci and then we have the gyri which is the smooth surface. And if you take a cortical slice and you look at the tissues, you can see that the cells are all lined up parallel to each other and perpendicular to the surface. And really they're dominated by the pyramidal neurons. And so these are the cells that we're interested in in MEG. And the signals that we detect with the MEG and the EEG are generated by the excitatory and the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. And so the sources for the MEG come primarily from the intracellular current flow. Um, and so as, they, uh, as these uh, neurons are synapting, then we have a current flowing on the inside of the neuron. And then we also have the return currents or the volume currents. And these are the currents that the EEG is picking up. So the MEG sees the intracellular current flow and the EEG sees the volume currents. And so based on the geometry of what the MEG sees and what the EEG sees, which system do you think will see radial sources better? These are the gyral sources or on the smooth surfaces of the brain. Do you think the MEG will see it better? The EEG will see it better? Or they'll both see it the same or will neither of them see it? And we'll just give it a moment for the polling question. And I think this is my last polling question. Yes, this is my last polling question. Almost half of the participants voted by now. Let's give it a few more seconds. Uh, let's go close the poll, I think. Yeah, so the results um, uh, are interesting. Uh, almost 48% uh, of the people um, have a, a right answer that is EEG uh, sees radial uh, sources better. Uh, uh, remaining 37% thinks MEG um, sees radial sources better, and 15% audience thinks both uh, sees okay. radial sources better. So, yeah. Great. So, um, and so the radial sources are seen better by the EEG. So anything on the gyral surface is seen better by the EEG. And so in this image here, the gyral sources, and I hope you can see my cursor as I'm moving it around. So the gyral sources or the radial sources have a neuron that is lined up perpendicular to the surface. And then the gyro, the sulci or the tangential sources are those that are inside of the wrinkles. And those are the ones that are um, parallel to the scalp, right? And at the bottom of the wrinkle will be a radial source because now we're at the bottom. And so the neurons are lined up again, like they're pointing to the skull. And so that would be a, a uh, at the bottom of the fissure or the bottom of the sulci is going to be considered a radial dipole. And I have some examples showing where we actually see that. So each component, each system, MEG and EG, does pick up a little bit of the other source, but MEG is much more sensitive to these tangential sources inside of the sulci, and EEG is much more sensitive to these radial sources that are on the gyri. Right? And so what we're going to use with our modeling technique is we're going to use a single equivalent current dipole. And this is just a representation of the synchronized postsynaptic currents that are flowing. And remember, it's not just one neuron. We have a bundle of neurons that are, um, are active at the same time that are creating enough of a signal that it can be detected by the EEG or the MEG. And so this uh, dipole source model is just a math method, just an algorithm. It's just an estimation of where we feel the source that we recorded the activity from would theoretically come from inside of the brain. I mean, so basically the rest of the talk is to go over these six different scenarios so you can understand where MEG was maybe better and where EEG was maybe better, but where they both add something to the patient's uh, information to help decide what's going on in the patient's brain. And again, this is John Ebersol. This is sort of, um, he was the one that created this and I'm just borrowing it. So we're going to look at where the MEG is detected and we're going to get the tangential source with the MEG. Oh, but there's one point one, maybe we're not seeing any MEG at all. And then there's another point here with the question mark in number three, where maybe we're seeing a small component of the MEG, or the MEG might be contaminated by the magnetic artifact from some metal in the body. Um, and so the, we'll see the EEG radial component. 
So here we have the radial component, and maybe we have one time we're not seeing the radial component at all. And then when we look at whether the MEG and the EEG spikes line up, we call that when they're in synchrony or synchronized, or there's two cases where maybe the MEG leads or the EEG leads. And then what EEG adds? And so this is the part that we'll go over with the cases that I'm gonna show. So in the first one, we're gonna detect both the MEG and the EEG. So we're gonna see spikes in both. They're gonna be synchronized. And we're gonna show that you're seeing both components. So this is a 21-year-old male with drug-resistant focal epilepsy. Uh, he has a cyst-like foci in the left inferior temporal lobe, but the video EEG suggested left temporal and frontal lobes. And so they sent him for a mag to see if we could tell more if it was temporal or if it was more frontal. So you can see here we have 23 interictal activity spikes that were averaged together. Um, and so you can see in the mag, you can see a spike, and in the EEG, you can see a spike. And in our MAG data, it was 148 channels. And so we line them up so that the top part is always the left channels, then we have the anterior channels, then we have the right channels, the central channels, and the parietal channels, right? And so in the EEG, we have the left here at the top, right? and the right are gonna be down here at the bottom. I and mean, so when we looked at those MAGs, we went through them, we found 13 that looked really good. And so we can individually create a dipole for each spike, and that you can see then as the green dipoles here. <clears throat> and they all look sideways, which means they're tangential to the sensor outside of the head. So they were seen um, as tangential sources. And if we add or average them together, then you're gonna get the red dipole in the middle, which is the average. Um, and so you can see the average here is right at the edge in a tangential orientation. I mean, then when we look at the EEG, you can see the EEG we actually imaged 23 spikes here, and you can see there's a cluster in the temporal area. But notice that all of these dipoles are looking out of the brain, so they look like they're deeper, and they're looking like a flashlight is shining out of the head, so you're looking at the tops of the dipoles, and so that tells us these are all radial sources. And if we average them together, the red is the average, and you can see the spike there. So in this, um, in this grouping, the EEG was more on the, um, more in the medial um, aspect of the uh, temporal lobe. So you can see down here. And notice that the dipole here is radial, right? So we're at the bottom of a sulci here, <clears throat> looking outward. Um, and that's why the EEG was able to detect these sources because they were coming from somewhere down a little bit deeper in the brain at the bottom of the sulci. Right? Um, and so, the reason that the, the MAG and the EEG kind of see different localizations is because they're really detecting the different component of the activity in the brain, right? Um, and I know some people on the, on the call are actually trying to determine a way to look at both an MEG and an EEG combined solution where you would get one localization that you feel is more appropriate. But for the most part, for clinically, we don't try and do that. We try and keep them separate because we know exactly what we're looking at when we're looking at EEG, and we know exactly what we're looking at with the MEG. And so we get the components of each. Um, and so then if we look at where the MEG, where we see no EEG component, this one's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, we have a MEG spike here, which I see my line is right on top of, so you can't see it. But you can see in the EEG, there's no component of a spike in the EEG at all. This is an 18-year-old right-handed male um, with autism and intractable localization-related epilepsy. Um, and there was an encephalomalacia in the right parietal lobe. And the EEG just showed some, some slowing in the right temporal regions, but no clear abnormalities that were epileptiform. And so the MAG, when we look at one spike, we can see it's right here. And again, because you can see the dipole on the side, we know it's a tangential source. Here's the encephalomalacia, and we're right at the edge of that. Uh, you can see it's a tangential short source here. And when we look at the EEG at that exact same latency, you might see there's some little spiking activity here, uh, but not enough over the background noise to be really significant. And But we tried to fit a dipole to it anyways. And when you see the dipole here, you can see this large ring. And this is our confidence volume, where we determine whether uh, the, the source is really coming from this location and how comfortable we are. But we're not comfortable here because it really could be coming from anywhere inside of this red sphere. And so that's our confidence volume. You can see it's like 2,000 milliliters. So we're, we're sure that even though there's a dipole here, we wouldn't be confident that this was something that you would want to report. 
I mean, we can use a current distribution technique on the MEG or the EG. This was on the MEG. And you can see that right here at the, the edge of the encephalomalacia was the area that was uh, having some epileptic activity. Um, and the MEG dipole was only 30 milliliters, which is a nice dipole confidence volume. So it was good to report that. Um, and then clearly EEG is going to add to that component where when we get MEG that's really noisy and we're just not sure if what we're seeing is um, a MEG spike or if it's um, something to do with the artifact. So this is a 16-year-old left-handed male who had had a hemorrhage and he'd had a shunt and placed it in the left side. Um, but he also has localization-related epilepsy. And so uh, he was sent for a MEG. And we clearly see 18 beautiful spikes. And they line up, it looks like they line up pretty good with the EEG and the MEG. I mean, so when we looked at the EEG first, we wanted to see where it localized to. And you see it localizes back here in the posterior area, right at the back here. You can kind of see it better here. It's a radial source. Um, kind of the orientation I'm looking at maybe looks tangential, but it, it is really radial. Um, and then this was another run we looked at. We saw 18 spikes, nicely, nicely seen in the EEG. And again, we have this um, dipole back here in the occipital lobe, uh, in the posterior, in the inferior portion of the occipital lobe. And so when we wanted to look at the MEG, the MEG actually was putting it up in the superior parietal area. And actually, this was right where the shunt was, or very close to where the shunt was localized. I um, mean, so we found that even though we had something looks that looks maybe spike like in MEG, when we actually looked at where it was coming from, we realized it was an artifact. So in this case, the, the EEG provided the better information, not the MEG because of this shunt. So a lot of times when we're doing patients with um, metal in their body, we always have to worry about whether we're seeing something artifactual or whether we're seeing something real. And so it's very nice to have the EEG simultaneously recorded uh, to see if we can see something there. Occasionally, though, when we do the MEG, we won't see anything in the MED, but we will see something in the EEG. And so this is a 57-year-old female with intractable localization-related epilepsy, and she also has left mesial temporal sclerosis on the MRI. Um, and the EEG patterns are left temporal, but they're actually with some right hemisphere early on in the seizure. So they sent her for a mag to see if there was anything that we could see that would show for the um, in the right hemisphere. And so you can see here clearly the nice EEG spike. Um, but in the mag uh, on the right side, maybe there's something here, maybe not. Um, and when we look at one spike in the EEG, we have this beautiful small volume. It's only three milliliters, and you can see it's um, sort of a frontal temporal, more medial temporal location. And again, it's a radial source, um, and you can see it's at the bottom of the uh, at bottom of the sulci, and you can see that it's nicely radial, so it's nicely picked up by the EEG. But when we look at that exact same time latency for the MEG, and we try to fit a dipole for it, um, you can see that there really is no spike. Um, and they, the location is outside of the brain, and the, the volume is so high that the dipole could be anywhere in here that it's not, there's no confidence that that actually is mapping anything in the brain. So the EEG, when we're looking at something um, that is very radial and deep, the EEG can pick it up. As you can see here, we have a cluster of EEG spikes that we detected that are all at the bottom of the, um, the sulci there, but nicely localized, and the average uh, is a nice small confidence volume, so we're very confident with the location of this. And you can see right here where it, where it actually localized to the average did. Uh, but then when we looked at the mag and we just said, okay, maybe we have a left, we have 11 spikes that maybe we think could be could be detectable. Um, so we put we let the computer go ahead and and put those on, and you can see it's a extremely scattered looking pattern. Um, and it tells us that there is really no component of the MEG that could be used for energy, any imaging technique at all. The confidence volume is high. And so with this patient, uh, it was we, we definitely were happy that we had the EEG. So it really helped us to understand uh, you know, that the EEG was really nicely localizing in the brain where the activity was coming from. I um, mean, so then the last two things that I wanted to go over, and I'll try and make them quicker in the interest of time, um, is so when we're looking at these radial and tangential sources, and so if the MEG leads first, we're going to see that tangential component first. And so here you can see that the MEG sees the spike here, but the EEG clearly is later, uh, at, at a later point. So we know that the epilepsy spike propagated in the brain from where it could be seen in the MEG to where it could be seen in the EEG. 
And so when we look at the MEG, we have a, uh, a cluster up here in the central parietal area, um, but it's slightly on the uh, right side, on the right side here. And it's really a tangential source, so the MEG is detecting it. And then we looked at where the EEG was at that later time point. You can see that it is now still up in the central area, but now it has gone down into the, um, into the lower layers. And so the spike is propagated from the top down into the deeper portion of the brain. Um, and again, our confidence volumes are very nice for the average for the EEG. I mean, so it really helps us to understand that um, the dipole is moving. So sometimes if you just start out with EEG and you see the dipole here, you might not realize that it had started up in a different location and propagated to this location. And so if you're talking about surgery or putting in an RNS lead, uh, it's really nice to say, no, this is where the MEG started. And so maybe we wanna make sure that we are covering this area with the lead, or if we're gonna do a resection or an ablation, you wanna make sure that you're starting with the starting point of where that epileptic activity is first seen. Okay. Um, and so for those of you that are out there looking at that combined MEG and EEG source location, if I take the EEG data and the MEG data and I put it all into one dipole and I ask where does it come from, in this one it actually did a pretty good job, but we're actually on the EEG um, uh, spike, I believe, um, and it puts it sort of in between where the spike started and where the spike ended. So we don't normally do this. Uh, this is just because I know that some researchers that are on are actually working on this problem and trying to come up with a way to do the uh, source localization with one dipole from, from both uh, data from both the MEG and the EEG. So and I just thought this was pretty close. So this is a pretty good uh, dipole location for both of them for the combined uh, one. Um, and then the final case uh, where we have the EEG leads, um, and Dr. Ebersol, he had only that 5%, and I think at Henry Ford, we, we even have less. And so I couldn't find a case that I really wanted to actually profile because I didn't have one that was very nicely showing the EEG spike preceding the MEG. So this is from Dr. Ebersol's uh, JCNP publication in 2008, where he talks about the tangential and the radial components. And you can clearly see that the EEG spike and the MEG spike, and the EEG spike was here, and it propagated uh, more medial to the MEG location here on the uh, posterior part of that uh, temporal tip in the, for the epilepsy patient. And so in summary, I hope I've shown you that both MEG and EEG are complementary. And when we're running epilepsy patients, they both provide information about neural activity with that millisecond temporal pre precision so that we can really see if there's a tangential source or a radial source that's leading one or the other. And then with the spatial resolution, we can clearly identify where the sources are coming from in the brain. Um, and then that simultaneous detection really will characterize fully what the epileptic activity is in the brain and where it's coming from. And so with knowledge, the higher you climb on a mountain, the higher you reach, the more you can appreciate. With the brain information we collect, the more we collect, the clearer the solution becomes to be able to help the patients with epilepsy determining what kind of a surgical option they like to move forward with. So thank you for your attention, and I'd like to thank the neurodiagnostic team here at Henry Ford that makes it all possible. So well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Boyer, for the interesting case studies and for the excellent and very inform informative presentation. Uh, I hope audience enjoyed it, enjoyed the talk as much as I did. Um, you had actually a very interesting line uh, on the last slide that the more uh, brain, in the more brain information we collect, the clearer the solution becomes. And I think um, it's very much reflected by your presentation that how combining EG and MEG we can obtain a, a more clear solution. So thank you very much for that.